right, excellent, Dr. Howell and Dr. Weeb, thank you so much. A uh, couple quick shout outs. Since we talked about the Ivy League, uh, Scott Roy from Dartmouth, thanks for joining us. Um, we have a viewing party going on in Virginia, Eastern time zone, so two hours ahead of us here in Colorado, a viewing party, that's impressive. Even more impressive, more than 20 people have joined a viewing, a viewing party in China. On live with us right now in China, more than 20 people at a viewing party. So thank you both the Virginians and the Chinese contingent for joining us. And now we'll flip it over to Dustin for a Q&A. All right, Dr. Weave and Dr. Howell, thank you for that excellent session. We've got a ton of questions for you from the audience. The first one comes from our good friend, Dr. Jeff Schild at Texas Children's Hospital, one of our National Medical Network partners. Dr. Howell, uh, he was interested in your recommendations for neuromuscular training protocols and if there are sport-specific recommendations when you implement those. Yeah, that's a, a good question. Um, I don't know of anything specifically off the top of my head, and we're at the very kind of beginning of this research. I think kind of the intention was to try to just better understand if there's something that we could put into uh, uh, return to play paradigms uh, for concussion that incorporates something other than just <clears throat> aerobic exercise and uh, monitoring symptoms, uh, things like that. Maybe get a little bit more formalized with some of the specific training uh, kind of programs that have been established kind of borrowing from other uh, research groups in other areas. So. Um, at this point, I think no, uh, but there's a lot of work to be done in this area, and I think that once we kind of better understand, you know, can there be something that can, uh, uh, you know, modulate or I guess reduce the risk of injury for this potentially vulnerable population, this post-concussion population, this might be something that uh, uh, we can start to get more sport-specific with. Thank you. And Dr. Howell, you were uh, able to mention some of the research that's been done by our staff. Uh, April McPherson, who wrote the uh, increased injury risk. She's one of our um, young data analysts now after finishing her PhD at Mayo, and we do a lot of work with Dr. Wilkerson. Um, also, a lot of people are interested in uh, neuroplasticity, neuromechanical coupling protocols. The research of Dustin Grooms is phenomenal for all the people that asked about that. Uh, Dr. Weave, your difference of differences approach on the kickoff, that research model, showed huge effect sizes. Some of the audience didn't fully understand what the intervention was. Um, could you first describe the policy change, why it worked? And I think there's good understanding now that policy change is one of the most effective ways to reduce injury. So are there any other policies that you see from your broad database outside of American football that you see as like the next one up that'll be effective and help other athletes? Thanks, Dustin. So good to be here with you all. Yeah, in 2016, what happened in Ivy League American football was two things. They moved forward the kickoff line in hopes of giving the kickers a better of chance of landing the ball in the end zone. And if the ball lands in the end zone, that incentivizes the return specialist to catch the ball and take a knee, which says, I'm not going to try to run this, to run this out. And their team comes out and starts um, um, starts afresh. And um, and they also moved um, the point from which that new play will start as a way to incentivize the receiver further to do that. And so really, you know, it was the coaches that said, let's try this because they had observed that they thought disproportionately um, this team was charging in this direction very hard during a kickoff. This team was charging this this hard or in this direction very hard. And from a first look at the numbers, um, rates of kickoff return injury were just really high. So that happened. We um, wanted to evaluate whether that reduction was more than would occur by chance. But of course, there's a threat um, to any study design, which is just before and after, and that is history. Something else might have happened. So we brought in a control group, and that was rates of concussion during non-kickoff returns. And the difference in differences analysis looks at the difference in the exposed group, kickoff returns, and we saw the line went way down. And we subtracted that out from that difference, we subtracted the difference in non-kickoff return concussions, 
which was more shallow and flatter. So removing that, um, which would control for other things that may have happened in 2016, we saw that there was a large, large reduction in, in, that, um, in that type of play. Um, so kudos to the coaches for doing that. And we were so glad to be able to evaluate and put relatively um, strong numbers behind it. Many other opportunities to evaluate policies in the Ivy League and the Big Ten, which are two of the large athletic conferences in the NCAA in the United States. Um, opportunities to look at lacrosse and how in that sport, men wear um, different types of equipment, in particular helmets, and women only wear eye guards and um, try to gain insight into whether helmets might be protective for women or if there are just other things about the, the way that games are played which are producing concussions in both women and men. That, that's one example of an opportunity um, to evaluate whether a policy change could, could lead to further reductions. Thank you, uh, Dr. Howell. The next question is for you, and this is from me. Um, we've been watching your eye tracking research in the past, and we've gone down similar routes, I think even studying similar devices. Um, what do you think the current state is of using eye tracking as a concussion assessment and return to play tool? That's a, that's a really good question. You know, I think, um, you know, it, it makes perfect logical sense that the visual dis uh, system would be disrupted following a concussion. Um, I don't know the exact number, but, you know, uh, somewhere between 55 and 70 percent of your brain in some way is uh, related to vision. And so you injure the brain, uh, likely, um, you know, you, you injure your ability to uh, uh, track uh, with your eyes um, or some sort of visual disruption, whether it's focusing or, or tracking objects or whatever. Um, so I think it's a it's a very useful component um, and uh, visual assessment in general can provide some really um, I would say meaningful clinical insights uh, that shouldn't be overlooked. Um, as far as the utility um, of vision alone, um, I think it, it probably contains uh, some degree of, of diagnostic, prognostic, uh, and recovery monitoring uh, ability, uh, but that's probably for a certain percentage of cases. Um, there's probably a lot of cases that um, other uh, tests may be useful to use as well. Um, and so that's why I think just that, again, as a piece of that multifaceted assessment, uh, vision should uh, certainly be central and, and something that everybody considers uh, within their kind of on-field assessment, but then also in the clinic when, when you're clearing people to return to play. And like you said, we're working on ways to develop um, objective methods to uh, kind of reduce some of that inner tester reliability or even test, or test retest reliability. Um, some of the, the issues that have uh, kind of been present that I mentioned briefly from other tests um, that, you know, from the NCAA DOD care consortium has found that kind of common clinical tests, including some vision tests have, I would say, uh, or what did they say, less than optimal reliability. So um, certainly a, an important part to, to include. Thank you. And along the, the lines of new innovations, Dr. Weeb, you mentioned the guardian cap. And I think we have dozens of questions on for more detail on the guardian cap. Do you feel comfortable uh, talking more about that? Happy to talk about it. Um, I have no answers. Colleagues from the study are also texting me, um, wanting to think more about the Guardian Caps, and we have not even started to explore it. You know, I could add, I think a great place to start exploring that um, would be, I really admired um, Dr. Rimmer this morning talking about his work in uh, football in Utah and gaining a perspective from the players and coaches on why they think certain things would be happening. And so to put that in more formal terms, conducting a mixed method study where we evaluate whether introducing an intervention like that seems to have an effect and whether or not it does, talking with the experts, these key stakeholders, including athletic trainers, um, to understand that there's definitely something to be learned there. And I too early to say what the answer would be. Thank you, and that's a fair answer. Uh, Dr. Howell, there's some interest in how people can apply your dual task tests clinically. Are they easily done on a sideline, for example? Are there any resources you can give people so they can do that? Um, could you take that question? 
Yeah, certainly. So that's a, that's a really common question. And um, I realize a lot of the research that uh, kind of I started with was in a, you know, 3D motion analysis lab. Like I mentioned, you know, that's not super feasible for most clinicians. To, uh, we've tried to, uh, or we have successfully implemented different dual task approaches in different clinical environments. Um, I have to credit uh, Dr. Julie Wilson, who is uh, uh, one of the concussion co-directors uh, at uh, Children's Hospital Colorado, um, for our co-director for our concussion program. She, in our sports medicine clinic, um, has kind of encouraged the implementation of routine dual task tandem gait testing uh, for uh, all of our patients uh, over the past year. And so um, what that entails is we'll have uh, the patient complete the tandem gait test, which if you're not familiar with it, is just a, a three meter strip of tape that you put on the floor and have the person uh, walk as fast as they can in a heel toe manner um, down and back. And then um, really, you know, the, the dual task is intended to compare that kind of single task performance. So you're just focused on the, on the tandem gait task. How fast can you complete this test? Um, and you compare that to something where there's a, a secondary, a cognitive or some sort of uh, distractor task, a cognitive perturbation. And so what we've been using are kind of easily implementable question and answer tasks. So subtract numbers by seven, uh, you know, spell a word backwards, say the months backwards, things like that. And uh, so that's been one way that we've been able to incorporate this into our um, uh, routine clinical practice as kind of an augment, augmentative way to uh, look at postural control and cognition simultaneously. Uh, and, and our initial results are actually pretty promising. They're in review right now, uh, but there, there appears to be some diagnostic and prognostic value to uh, using this in a sports medicine clinic. So again, uh, less on the sideline, but more, you know, seven to, we'll say, 21 days or so post-injury when athletes are coming into us and we want another kind of objective testing tool. It's been useful. Uh, we haven't tested it directly on the sideline, and I know that there's some of my colleagues across the country that are using it for kind of that same day testing. Uh, but I do think that uh, I would encourage clinicians to kind of get um, creative in your setting to, to understand um, what a motor task is and what a, a cognitive task is and, and how you could potentially combine those two to get information from both of them independently and then um, combine, see where the trade-offs are, and that might lead to, to some clinically relevant information. Thank you. And uh, this question will take to each of you, and we've only got a couple minutes, so if you could maybe throw your, your bullet points at it because it's a, it's a huge question. It's, where do you think the most important future directions in concussion research are? Um, Dr. Howell, you're, you're on the camera, so we'll go with you first. Yeah, that, that, it's a very, very big question, and I could probably talk for another three hours about that. I won't. Um, I, will, I will say, my, at least for me, the most interesting thing that, that I'm in, uh, currently thinking about is, is rehabilitation strategy and engaging professionals from different specialties, whether they be physical therapists, uh, athletic trainers, uh, physicians, uh, some of our optometrist colleagues, as you mentioned with vision, and how we can uh, identify who can benefit from what treatments. Because concussion is such an umbrella term. There's so many different presentations, and there's so many different potential treatments that people may benefit from. Identifying those individualized pathways so that we can get athletes back to playing sports and do it in a safe manner so they're not going to have uh, these, you know, uh, potential recurrent injuries or, or new injuries that that pop up uh, following this this initial event. Um, so, so on the rehabilitation front, that's that's certainly where I'm most interested. I, I wouldn't say it's the most important. That's just my biased opinion. Yeah, and Dr. Howell, that's something we're spending a lot of time on at the USOPC clinically is building tools so we can, like a lot of groups, try to subclassify concussions into a certain symptom or functional profile, target it with treatments, and see if that's better than standard care. Which you know, we don't know if that's a waste of time and resources or if it is effective, but we, it feels like the right thing to do, and so we're trying to study that now. Uh, Dr. Weeb, can you uh, talk to us about the future of concussion in your mind? Sure. Briefly, uh, for prevention, for a given sport, um, thinking about, strategic thinking about policy change and practice changes, but also introducing them using randomized designs. I think the field is ready for that in part because so many of the changes we might like to make, um, the state of whether knowledge on whether that change could be um, efficacious, we're really in equipoise. Uh, we don't know what would be better or worse. There's so little evidence. We could pursue some of these questions with a randomized trial. 
Also, in part because I think that observational studies get dinged, unduly so, um, um, in part just because people know the mantra that if it's observational, there must be problems with the study. Um, so I will stop there with that one. Um, but then for recovery, what I'd like to really see evaluated is we have evidence from this study that athletic trainers are doing very well at following consensus guidelines to have a concussed athlete proceed through the steps accordingly for return to exertion and return to practice and return to full play. I would really like to, I'm very interested in the, in return to learn relative to return to exertion and which one might come first to lead to better outcomes. So I think that's a question that remains in the field and I'd love to see that explored. And I think there's a chance to do that with this study too. Yeah, you bring up some great comments that, like I said before, policy change doesn't sound cool, doesn't have a lot of sex appeal, the word policy change, but the effect sizes are massive. And so we should probably go down that route because it's proven to work. Um, okay, thank you both. Thank you, Dr. Howell. Thank you, Dr. Weeb. We are going to kick it back to Charlie. Uh, Charlie, you ready? Ready as I'm going to be. Excellent. Thank you, doctors. Thank you, Dustin. That was awesome. Appreciate it. Love the pen shirt, Dr. Weeb. Um, so we remember trivia polling. We got a couple, one medicine question, one Olympic question coming up. So please poll during the break. As, re as a reminder, the SPRI and the US Olympic and Paralympic Foundation, private resources are critical for us to implement and expand programming in the research area, as well as preventative sport medicine. So any considerations on uh, making a donation, just go to the link on the trailer and uh, you can make a donation to SPRI and or the US Olympic and Paralympic Foundation. Enjoy your break. A quick shout out to Tandis Howley from UCLA Athletics. Tell Lisa Fernandez she is still the greatest female leader in Olympic sport I've ever met in my life, three-time Olympian, and also Miami University of Ohio. Having a viewing party? You guys are awesome. Thanks for joining us. Bye.